We're going to work on some puzzles today, which means class participation. And we're going to start in Leviticus 4. And we've been considering the sacrifices of the Mosaic Covenant for the reason that the series of sacrifices are involved in the ordination of the high priest. And we're going to go back into Exodus once we have something of a better feel for the sacrificial system. Shortly after God told Moses how to construct the tabernacle, he started telling him about these sacrifices. And when it was all set up at the end of Exodus, these sacrifices were set up too. Now, there are five basic sacrifices, and they can be grouped in three basic sacrifices. The three fundamental sacrifices are the sin and trespass offerings. Really, almost probably should reverse that. And then the ascension offering with its tribute and the peace offering. Now, you can remember this because it's the order of worship. We confess our sins. We draw into God's presence with our offerings and we hear His Word preached to us. And then we have the communion meal. That's the peace offering. And as we are studying the rituals connected with each of these, each of these sacrifices runs through the same steps. All the sacrifices do the same thing. First of all, you bring your animal in, you put your hands on it, which means the animal represents you. Then you kill it and you get blood out of it. Now that represents the animal dying for your sins. And then you take blood and you put it on the altar. And why do you put blood on the altar? So God can see it. God knows it's there anyway, but you're supposed to display it. Just like Passover, you had to put blood on the door. Just like when Moses' son was circumcised by his mother, she smeared the circumcision blood on his leg, and then it says the angel of the Lord left them alone. So blood is put on the altar and God is satisfied. Then you cut the animal up. Every animal except Passover is cut up. And you put it on the fire. Now, does this fire mean the animal is being judged for your sins? No. The fire does not mean the animal is judged for your sins. The fire represents God's presence. And the animal is taken into God's presence and transformed and ascends as smoke and is a sweet savor to God and God is pleased. Every sacrifice goes through those steps with certain variations. Now, in the sin offering, the big emphasis is on one thing. And in the ascension offering, the emphasis is on a different part of that ritual. And in the peace offering, the emphasis is on a different part of that ritual. What is emphasized in the sin offering? Who remembers? The blood is emphasized. As we look at the ritual for the sin offering, we find they get the blood out and you sprinkle some of it seven times and then you put some of it on the top of the altar and you pour some of it down at the bottom of the altar. It's the blood that's emphasized. The other sacrifices, you don't have to do all that with the blood. You just splash it on the altar and that's enough. With the ascension offering, what is emphasized? It's the flesh that's emphasized. The ascension offering or whole burnt offering you cut the animal up into four pieces. Two clean pieces, which are the head and the fat. And those go on first. And then two unclean pieces that you have to wash, which are the legs and the guts. And then they're put on afterwards. What do we say that represented? First of all, Jesus goes up into heaven, the head and the fat. And then baptism, we're washed, and then we follow Him. We're the legs and the guts. You can decide whether your guts or legs. Ladies are guts and men are legs. Or is it the other way around? The peace offering, what is emphasized in the ritual? The fat. The fat is the part you eat. And it talks about the fat that's on the liver and the lobe of the liver and the fat tail and the fat that's over the kidneys. And all those parts are given to God to eat. And then you get to eat the rest of it. Well, actually, you don't get to eat all of it. You see, the consecrated breast, which is lifted up to God, that's given to the priests, and it's holy and only the priest can eat it. And the contribution leg is not lifted up to God, and it's not holy, but it's given to the priest, and he can take it home, and the priest and his family can eat it. But all the other parts, you get to eat. Well, as I pointed out last time, I've been wrong about this, and probably make this mistake again several times, but the priest can take the 
wave the lifted breast home to eat as well as the leg, but it's a matter of he eats it with all the other priests and with God. The meal has really two parts. God eats his part, and he shares that with the priests. Then the offerer eats his part, and he shares the leg with the priest. And the priests are sort of the mediators who link God and the offerer in the meal. But with that mistake aside, let's continue. Okay, so it's a fellowship meal, and you can eat the fat that's all marbled in. But the special fat that's on the inside, the innermost fat, that's given to God and turned into smoke for God. Now, that's the ritual. And for a full slew of sacrifices, you're going to start with a sin offering, which gives you access to God. Then you're going to move to an ascension offering, where you dedicate yourself to God again. And then you're going to sit down and have a meal with God at the peace offering. Because that's what we'll do today. We'll do it in an hour. Essentially, through Christ, because each of these represents Christ, through Christ, our sins are forgiven. Through Christ, we hear the gospel. Through Christ, we have a communion meal. So, through the animal. Now, today, we have already reviewed Leviticus 1 through 3 and considered these. Now, we're going to consider the sin offering and we're going to look at some puzzles connected with it. The first thing we have to say about the sin offering and the trespass offering is that they have never existed before. Abraham never offered any sin offerings. Abraham offered ascension offerings, whole burnt offerings, and he put cereal on as a tribute, grain, and he offered peace offerings. And so did the children of Israel. When we got to Mount Sinai months and months and months ago, and we had the Ten Commandments read to us, then in Exodus 24, 5, it says, the young men of the sons of Israel offered burnt offerings, that is, ascension offerings, and they sacrificed young bulls as peace offerings to the Lord. So they had ascension or burnt offerings, and they had peace offerings, but they never had any sin offerings. Sin offerings didn't exist, and trespass offerings didn't exist. Now, why do you think that is? What's different now? What is different now that now all of a sudden we have these new kinds of sacrifices here, sin offerings and trespass offerings? The law has come. Specifically what? Apart from the law, there is no imputation of sin, right, Romans? So the coming of the law really does highlight the need for a sin offering, and that's true. There's one other factor involved. Let me give you some hints. Up till this time, up until the first day of year two after the Exodus, that's the day the tabernacle is set up. The fire comes down. Up until that day, who is allowed to offer sacrifices? Anybody. Anybody can offer a sacrifice. But after that day, who's allowed to offer sacrifices? Put them on the altar. Why? Well, it's because we have this specially holy place, the tabernacle courtyard and the tabernacle itself with God's throne in the middle of it and gateway here. And in order to get up on this altar to approach it, in order to go into here, you have to be set apart and ordained as a priest. That's really where we are in our study of Exodus now. And if you're not, you can't go up on this altar because this altar is holier than the older altars used to be. Abraham made an altar. He just took some stones and piled it up. And he might even put the sacrifice on the altar and kill it right there on the altar and burn it up. But now this altar is much holier. It's going to be dedicated with blood and oil. It's made of bronze. And you don't kill the animal on it. You kill the altar over here somewhere and then put the pieces on it. This is a holier altar. And only priests can go up on it. Did everybody accept that when this change came? No. See, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, they said all the people are holy. Everybody gets to be a priest. And what happened to them? The earth ate them up, yeah. So, now this is holy. And to come into this place, you got to be kind of holy. And what if you're just not quite holy enough? What if you become unclean? You can't go in, so what do you have to do to go in? What is it that opens doors? We discussed this about a month ago. What is it that opens doors? What is it that opened the doors for the children of Israel when they were living in the land of Goshen and they needed to get out of Egypt, but they couldn't get out? And something was put on their door that opened the doors and let them out. 
Blood opens doors. Now, if you're messed up and you want to come in here and, and offer a sacrifice, you offer it over here and then the priest takes it up on the altar for you. What do you do to get back into shape so you can come through here? Yeah, that's where the sin offering comes in. And trespass offering. If you're just kind of unclean, you wash yourself and wait till evening. Because at evening, there's an evening sacrifice that takes away your sin. If you're a little bit more unclean than that, you have to wash yourself and your garments and wait for evening sacrifice. But if you really kind of mess up pretty bad, you got to bring a sin offering, and the sin offering lets you come back in. And once you've offered your sin offering and you can come back in, then you can offer your ascension offering. So you don't need sin offerings until this system is set up, but the sin offering opens the door. It allows you to come in. It opens the door so you can come in. That's why we confess sins at the beginning of the worship service. We could all stand around outside the door, confess sins out there, and then come into the room. That would dramatize the idea. Harold? Well, you come in near enough and get that sin offering taken care of, and then you can stay in and do other things. But your intention to offer the sin offering and so forth is what allows you to do it. In other words, you need to get into this area here. You need to be holy enough to come in here. Because what if you came in here and you weren't very holy? What would happen if you saw God face to face? You'd be burned up. The New Testament tells us that we all with unveiled face behold the glory of the Lord. How is that possible? It's because we're in union with Christ and He's looking at the Father all the time. If you're not in union with Christ, what happens on the day of judgment when everybody's face to face with God? Lake of fire. Revelation chapter 14 says that the wicked are put into a lake of fire that burns right in front of the throne of God. Now, I can go to anybody out there on the street and say, you're going to spend eternity in the presence of God. You may not like, but everybody's going to spend eternity in the presence of God. The lake of fire is the same as God's consuming fire. It's ultimately the same thing, except that we like the fire because we're in Christ. They don't like it because they're outside of Christ. Well, there are degrees of holiness here. And if you come in here and you're unclean, you're in deep trouble. You've got to get your uncleanness taken care of and then you can come in here. But even if you have your uncleanness taken care of and you're an ordinary circumcised Israelite, what would happen if you went up here and touched this altar? You'd be in deep trouble because the altar is holier. In fact, the Levites are obliged to kill you if you try to do that. Or if you go inside here. Only the priests can go inside here because they've been given extra holiness. They're able to get closer to God. But what if a priest goes into the most holy place? Well, he's in trouble. Only the high priest has been given enough holiness to go in here, and only once a year. There are degrees of it. Now, that's not true of us anymore. That's why all these middle walls are partitioned or down. There's no distinction between Jew and Gentile, no distinction between high priest and regular priest, no distinction between priests and people, because everybody's in Christ, and so everybody's face to face with the Father. But in the Old Testament, there were degrees. And to understand these laws, you've got to remember these degrees, and then they make sense. So the sin offering and the trespass offering, they come into being at this time in history so that people can have access to this more holy worship place, more dangerous worship place. It's more dangerous. And it's the fear of God that we're talking about here. Uh-huh. The trespass offering is offered for high-handed, premeditated sins and for original sin. And the sin offering, as we're about to see, is offered for sins that are committed in the state of confusion. So they're complementary to one another. And then in a sense, the trespass offering is the central offering because it's a male lamb. And Jesus is said to be the Lamb of God who takes away original sin, who takes away the most powerful forms of sin and that's what trespass offering is for. Once you take that away, then everything else is taken care of. Uh -huh. Jim, did the Old Testament saints have anything that was equivalent to the expression we have in the Old Testament in Christ? Was there any, any uh, whatever that connotates 
Was there anything equivalent to that in the Old Testament or Old Testament thing? Well, I think there are degrees of it. I think being in the land is one of them. It says in Leviticus 18 and 20 that if you commit certain abominations, the land will spit you out. When you get the New Testament, it says Jesus will spit you out of His mouth if you do these things. So the equivalent of being in Christ in the New Testament is being in the land. People wanted to be buried in the land. That was for circumcised people. I think there are different kinds of incorporation that typify being in Christ. Let's look at Leviticus 4. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, If a person sins unintentionally, and we said before that this means sinning, a wandering astray, being misled, of goofing up. Now, we'll see what some of those are. Let's just quickly look and see what some of these things are in chapter 5. These are examples of sins of wandering away. And they're listed over here in chapter 5, verse 1. Now, if a person sins after he hears a public adjuration, when he is a witness, whether he's seen or otherwise known, and he doesn't tell it, then he shall bear his guilt. Now, that's complicated just to read that out loud. Somebody says that some of his sheep have been stolen. And so the judges come and they go to all the neighbors and say, Do you know anything about this? You swear under oath. Put your hand on the Torah and swear that you don't know anything about it. Well, you know something about it. In fact, you know who probably did it. But the guy that probably did it is the guy that you owe a bunch of money to. And so you just don't want to turn him in. You're afraid to turn him in. And so you lie under oath and say, I don't know anything about this. And then later on, you come to feel guilty about it. Well, you sinned, but you sinned because you were under tremendous pressure. That's an example of a sin of inadvertency. Still a sin. Verse 2. This is a sin. If a person touches any unclean thing, whether the carcass of an unclean beast or the carcass of unclean cattle or a carcass of unclean swarming things, though it slips his memory and he is unclean, and then he feels guilty. Then it comes to him that he's guilty. That's literally what it says. What does that mean? Well, it's not sinful to touch an unclean carcass. you got to do it. cow dies in the field. you got to bury the cow. You can't eat it, and so you're going to have to dig a hole, and a couple of guys are going to have to throw that cow in there, and chances are you're going to touch it. That's not a sin, but you got to wash yourself and wash your garments and wait till sundown, and then you're clean. Well, you've just finished burying this cow. Then there's an emergency. Guy's ox is stuck in the ditch, so you go and help him with that. Then you get home, and your wife chews you out, and you just forget to wash yourself. Now you've done something wrong. You disobey. You became unclean and you didn't wash yourself and the sun has gone down. Well, now the problem is there. That's the sin of inadvertency. It slipped your mind. And now the uncleanness is stuck on you and you're going to have to bring a sin offering to take care of it. Verse 3 says, If you touch a human uncleanness of whatever sort his uncleanness may be, that's an issue of blood or actually touching a spot of leprosy on somebody. Again, it's not wrong to do that. If you were a doctor and you were examining... A woman or a man who had an issue of blood, you'd certainly have to get in there and check it out. But you're supposed to wash yourself and wash your garments and wait till sundown, wait till the evening sacrifice. But if you didn't do that, if you forgot about it, it slipped your memory, then when you come to know about it, then you've got to take care of it with a sin offering. Verse 4, if a person swears thoughtlessly with his lips to do evil or to do good, that doesn't mean evil in an immoral sense, but to do something one way or the other, to take some action. In whatever matter a man may speak thoughtlessly with an oath, and it slips his memory, then he comes to remember it, and he comes to be guilty. Somebody says, would you take this suit to the dry cleaners for me? And you say, sure, I'm heading that way. And they say, well, now don't forget it. You say, oh, I promise. I promise I'll do it. Well, then you get in the car, and you turn on the radio, and you like the music a whole lot, and you just head right on past the dry cleaner, and you forgot to do it. Well, you promised. And this is a little bit stronger than that. You swore an oath. But you did it thoughtlessly. Now the guilt is on you. Well, it says in verse 5, when he feels guilty, when he comes to feel guilty in one of these, he shall confess that which he has sinned, and he shall bring his penalty. Yours may say guilt or trespass offering, but in this case, that would be better translated penalty. You bring a penalty to the Lord for his sin that he has committed a female from the flock, a lamb or a goat, as a sin offering. So those are examples of sins of wandering away, things that you might do 
because you slipped your mind or you felt under tremendous pressure or something. And so those are the kinds of sins that the sin offering is going to deal with. Let's go back to Leviticus 4 now and look at a little bit of the ritual. If the anointed priest, and this is the high priest now, only the high priest is anointed. Repeat that after me. Only the high priest is anointed. Only one that has oil put on him. If the anointed priest who sins so as to bring guilt on the people, whoa! So when the high priest sins, guilt comes on the whole nation. Who was the first person who ever did that? Adam, right. Adam sinned and guilt came upon everybody. Now what does that mean to you as an Israelite citizen when it comes to the high priest? Are you going to pray for him so he doesn't sin and bring guilt on you? Yeah, are you going to encourage him to do right? Are you going to encourage him to preach the Word? Not to compromise and be a liberal? Are you encourage him to be tough as nails? Well, you better, because if he fools around and doesn't do what's right, sin comes on everybody. So it's a pretty good system here. Anointed priest who sins brings guilt on the people, then let him offer to the Lord a bull without defect as a sin offering for the sin he's committed. So, a bull of the herd. He shall bring the bull to the doorway of the tent of meeting. See, this is the idea of crossing the threshold. Now, the doorway is actually this whole forecourt area, but it's in front of the altar. And remember we said blood opens the door and enables you to come in. So, the doorway is important here. The doorway is not actually this area here, what we would think of as a door, but it's this forecourt, the area in front of the altar, is the doorway to the altar. He shall bring the bull to the doorway or the forecourt of the tent of the meeting before the Lord. He shall lay his hand on the head of the bull and slay the bull before the Lord. Then the anointed priest is to take some of the blood of the bull and bring it to the tent of meeting. So he brings it to the tabernacle. The priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle some of the blood seven times before the Lord in front of the veil of the sanctuary. That's the veil. The priest shall also put some of the blood on the horns of the altar of fragrant incense before the Lord, which is in the tent of meeting. And all the blood of the bull he shall pour out the base of the altar of burnt offering, which is at the doorway of the tent of meeting. That's a lot of blood, by the way. A bull has lots of blood in it. Several gallons of blood get poured out here. This place stank. You know it must have been full of flies. All this blood out there all the time. Well, then verse 8 says, He shall remove from it, after he does all this blood stuff, he shall remove from it the fat of the bull, the sin offering, the fat that covers the entrails, and the fat that's on the entrails, and the two kidneys with the fat that's on them, which is on the loins and the lobe of the liver. He shall remove with the kidneys, just as it's removed from the ox of the sacrifice of peace offerings. The priest is to offer them up in smoke on the altar of ascension offerings. But the hide of the bull and its flesh with its head and its legs and its guts and its refuse, that is, all the rest of the bull, he is to bring out to a clean place outside the camp where the ashes are poured out and burn it on wood with fire. Where the ashes are poured out, it shall be burned. So let's take it up in a little bit of detail here. You bring in the old bull and the priest, he's going to do this for himself. First of all, he takes some of the blood in here right before the veil and he dips his finger in it and he sprinkles it seven times in front of the veil. That's to cleanse the veil. Why it's seven times and why with the finger, I don't know. Maybe we'll get that figured out before we're done with all this. But Then he takes some of the blood, second of all, to the altar of incense, which is right in front of the veil, and he puts it on the top of it, which is the horns. These altars look like this. And they have these horns. And he daubs some up here on the top of the horns. And then he brings it out here to this altar and pours it out at the base. Now what he's done is he's opened a door from the top down. He's opened three doors. He's opened the veil. And he's opened this room here, the top of this altar. And then he's poured out the base of this altar and he's opened this door. So he's opened the door, a ladder from God down to man. He doesn't put the blood here first and then ascend up. The motion is that of grace, God moving down. He opens these doors from God down to the altar. Then he puts a fire on the altar and puts a fat on it, and this can ascend up to God. The animal can ascend up to God. But before the animal can ascend up to God, first of all, the doors have to be opened from God down to man. And then we ascend back up. That's the motion. 
So the blood is put in these places to open the doors. Then the fat, which is the part given to God, is put on the altar and it ascends back up and God is pleased. So, the doors are open. The high priest, he can go back in here. See, the high priest has sinned. He's blown it. He can't go back in here and change out the showbread. He can't go in here and trim the lamps. He can't go in here and offer the incense every day. He can't even put stuff on the altar. They're all too holy for him. He's lost holiness. He's got to get it back. And so, blood opens the door. And so now, he can offer this sacrifice here and the smoke goes up to God. And now, as a high priest, he can go back in and do this work because it's been opened back up for him. Now, then it says... And this is where the question comes. Verse 11 and 12. The hide of the bull and its flesh with its head and its legs and its entrails and its refuse, all the rest of the bull he is bring out to a clean place outside the camp where the ashes are poured out. And burn it on wood with fire where the ashes are poured out it shall be burned. Now, in the case of the ascension or whole burnt offering and peace offering, what happens to the skin, the hide of the bull? We haven't discussed this. It's not put on the altar and burned up. It's given to the priests. And the priest can keep it and sell it or do something with it. It's kind of a way of funding the tabernacle. You've got this nice big hide and you make lots of shoes from it or whatever else you want to make with leather. So that's given. It's not burned up. But then in the other sacrifices, usually the flesh of the animal is burned up on the altar for God. But in this case... The flesh is taken outside the camp and burned up with fire. Now, why? Yes, we can start to guess now. Now, Jesus is taken outside the camp, so it's his uh, sacrifice, and that was supposed to So, the priest wanted to sacrifice the sacred blood and so forth out there. The rest of the rest will not be burned up in the camp. So it's because the sin is lodged in the flesh somehow that it can't be put on the altar. Because as the sin is lodged in the flesh, it has to be burned outside. Does everybody follow that? Well, the sin of the... What you're saying... The high priest puts his hands on the bull and his sin is transferred to the bull. And the blood atones for it, but the sin is there in the flesh. And so Jesus, who knew no sin, was made sin for us. And so the sinful flesh can't be offered to God. It has to be burned outside the camp. Now, that's very attractive. There's some problems with that interpretation. I hope everybody sees what was just said, because this is now the question. First place is burned in a clean place outside the camp. Second of all, if we look over... At chapter 6, verse 24, we find that in other cases of sin offerings, the priest can eat some of it. Listen to this. Speak to Aaron and to his son, saying, This is the law of the sin offering. In the place where the ascension or burnt offering is slain, the sin offering shall be slain before the Lord. It is most holy. The priest who offers it for sin shall eat it. Unless it's one for himself. You see, we just saw if the animal is killed for the priest himself, then it's burned up outside the camp. But if it's an ordinary person's sin, the priest shall eat it. Well, that wouldn't seem to be unclean then. It shall be eaten in a holy place in the court of the tent of meeting. Anyone who touches its flesh shall become holy. So the flesh is not unclean. It's not sinfulness that's lodged in the flesh. Somehow or other, it's holiness that's lodged in the flesh. And anyone who touches his flesh becomes holy, hallowed. Which means that if you're a layman and you touch it, you become hallowed and you're in a lot of trouble. You're going to have to desanctify yourself and wash that holiness off. When any of its blood splashes on a garment, in a holy place you shall wash what was splashed on. So here you are. You've got to bring a lamb as a sin offering for yourself. And you put the lamb up on the table and you cut it with a knife and blood splashes on your clothes. But your clothes are holy and you're not. So you're going to have to wash those clothes off in a holy place and desanctify them. Then you're okay. Verse 28 says, Also the earthenware vessel in which it was boiled shall be broken. And if it was boiled in a bronze vessel, then it shall be scoured and rinsed with water. 
Every male among the priests may eat of it. It is most holy. But no sin offering of which any blood is brought into the tent of meeting to make atonement in the holy place shall be eaten. That's the priest's offering, the one we're looking at. It shall be burned with fire. Now, what this tells us is that the flesh of the animal is not because it has sin in it that is burned outside the camp, but because it's holy. We see this also in this regard as well. Leviticus 16, verse 26. And on the Day of Atonement, which is the big sin offering, this is the same idea here. Leviticus 16:26. The one who released the scapegoat shall wash his clothes and bathe his body with water and afterwards come into the camp. It does not say he shall be unclean until evening. He's not washing himself because he's unclean. He's washing himself because he's too holy. Now, verse 27, The bull of the sin offering and the goat of the sin offering whose blood was brought in to make atonement in the holy place shall be taken outside the camp and they shall burn their hides and their flesh and their refuse in the fire. And the one who burns them shall wash his clothes and bathe his body with water and afterwards come into the camp. But it doesn't say he's unclean till evening, which is what it always says in the case of contact with sin. Now, what this means is the animal becomes, the flesh becomes so holy that it has to be desanctified before anybody can eat it. And the reason is that the blood opens doors because it cleanses the door. Now, in order to clean something, you have to be stronger than dirt. <laughs> so, if you're going to clean this altar here, which needs to be made holy, you need something that's even holier than the altar to do the cleansing. Now, in an ordinary sin offering, which is a lamb or a turtle dove, which you offer for your sins, it's this altar here that has to be cleansed. The blood isn't taken up in here. So, it's holier than this altar, and the blood is put here, and it cleanses this altar, and now we've got the flesh. And the flesh, like the animal, like the blood, is holier than this altar. Now, the priests can eat the things that are offered on this altar. They can eat the peace offering, but this flesh is too holy for the priests to eat because they're not holy enough to eat it. It's too holy. So it has to be desanctified, dehallowed, to bring it down to a level to where the priests can eat it. So how do you do that? Well, you take some fire from off this altar and you put a brass pot or a clay pot and you cook the meat in it and that desanctifies the meat down to regular holy status. And then the priest can eat it. And only the priest can eat it. But what happens to the pot that you cooked it in? Well, all that holiness went into the pot. So if it's an earthenware pot, you've got to break it because it's too holy. You don't want to be fooling with it. And if it's a bronze pot, you've got to scour it out. That's what we just read. So you have pulled the super holy meat down to regular holy level, and now the priest can eat it. The layman can't eat it. It's only down here to the holy stage. A layman is just clean. He's not holy. But the priest can eat it. Now, if you want to cleanse these things up here, like this veil, you have to have something that's even more holy than the veil itself to clean it. But these things are real holy. And so the animal that sacrificed to clean these things has to be super holy. So now we got super holy sacrifice, the bull. And the super holy sacrifice cleanses the real holy tabernacle. Puts here on the veil and on this. Now you take this super holy sacrifice and you cook it in a clay pot or in a bronze pot and that brings it down to the real holy stage, but that's still too holy. There's nobody that can eat it. And so what do you do? You take it out here and you burn it outside the camp. Now, what does that tell you about the place outside the camp? No, it's super holy. Now, this is real important. This place outside the camp here is super holy. And whoever takes this bull outside the camp to burn it in this super holy place he has to wash himself in order to get back in the camp. 
But he has to wash himself in his garments to get this super holy off of him before he comes back into camp. Because if he comes back into camp with all this super holiness on him, he'll kill anybody he comes in contact with. Because he's super holy. He's walking around here with super holiness shining off of him and people are dying right and left. So for everybody else's protection, he needs to get the super holy off of him before he comes back into camp. Now, how come outside the camp is super holy? This is a good question, isn't it? <laughs> well, it's because, in a sense, outside the camp is face to face with God. Inside the camp, you've got these protections. And you're under the wings of God's umbrella and the wings of God's atonement when you're inside the camp. Passover puts you inside the camp. Circumcision puts you inside the camp. And that blood covers you, and so you're protected from God's super-duper holiness. And so, in a sense, you're protected from God's super holiness. It just puts you into kind of a clean space. But when you step outside the camp, in a sense, you're outside of this protection, and you're more exposed to God. Now, that's why Jesus dies outside the camp. He has to go outside of these areas of relative safety into the area where there is no safety outside the camp where you're face to face with God. Is it dangerous to be outside the camp? Yeah. Why? Well, because there are demons and bad things out there. Yeah, but who's in charge of all those demons? God is. They do His will. We don't believe that the devil and God are the same. The devil does God's will. Job tells us that. And so the dangers that exist outside the camp are dangers that come from God. And the reason why you've got to have a super holy sacrifice in order to cleanse this area here because it's real holy. But the super holy sacrifice has got to be burned out in a super holy place which is outside where you're face to face with God. That is actually the only way to integrate all the data on this. It is a puzzle. We probably will not come back to this. So if you didn't get it all, you might want to get this tape if you want. But that's the thought in this system here. You need to have these doors opened up. You need to clean ourselves so we can get into these places. But it takes really powerful offerings to do it. And the offerings are so powerful that they have to be taken care of in special ways. If the priest wants to eat some of it, they've got to be desanctified down to his level. And this offering that cleanses these things is too holy for that. Well, even... The offerings of the Old Testament, the most super-duper holy offerings of all, never really totally opened these doors. Only the offering of Jesus Christ is super-duper-duper-duper holy enough to cleanse all of this once and for all. And that's what all this points to. Well, where we want to go with this, and then we'll stop, but the ordination of the high priest, what we're going to see is, the reason he offers these sacrifices is, to open up the doors so he can go in and start doing his work. And if he sins, these doors get shut again. He has to bring blood and open these doors again so he can do his work. And it takes super holy blood and flesh to do it. If I didn't get it through, that's the best shot I can do at it. Let's close in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you that Jesus' blood is powerful enough completely to cleanse everything once and for all, to open up all the doors, to take down all the barriers once and for all, so that we can see You face to face. Help us to stand in union with Him and see You face to face. And also today, we thank You that You have given us His super-duper holy flesh and blood to eat and drink, which means that we are also priests at the highest level and that nothing needs to be desanctified before we can eat it, but that we who are in Christ can actually participate in a meal at this highest of all levels. We join Him outside the camp, exposed to You face to face, because we no longer fear to be outside the camp, because we no longer need to fear Your wrath. We ask now that You bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.